The only woman on Tennessee's death row is asking the court to reconsider her sentence. Krista Pike was sentenced to death for killing a woman back in 1996. a I've waxed poetic about satanic panic in a majority of the videos on this channel. From mentioning it for the first time in the Elise Pauler case to outright dedicating an entire outing to how it started in earnest. In almost all of those cases, the occult themes were either entirely fabricated or completely blown out of proportion in an age of growing mass media. And if the 1980s were any indication of how the media viewed anything even remotely satanic, the 1990s and the birth of the 24-hour news cycle was sure to explode with coverage. As the information age began its ascent to the non-stop social media machine it is today, stories of ritual slayings in West Memphis, Arkansas, or heavy metal-inspired sacrifices being highlighted in California would spread throughout the country at exactly the vicious speed one would expect. But today, I'm here to tell a story where that satanic panic was warranted in a tale of mental illness and rage. A ravaged mind and a shattered life led to a ravaged body and shattered skull in the woods of Tennessee, as well as the ironic fight for her life the perpetrator is still putting up to this day. Jealousy, psychopathy, the occult, and tragedy are all present in today's story. It is a highlight of a person who was so deeply damaged they committed unspeakable acts upon an innocent girl, yet continues to clamor for mercy as they rot away where they belong. It is one of the country's most notorious and is a perfect snapshot of the mid-90s media frenzy that was starving for wicked stories like it. And it's a tale that I intend to tell and give my thoughts and opinions on, as usual. This is the unprovoked satanic brutality of Krista Pike. I think teenagers probably have trouble ever imagining um, anything but immortality for themselves. They seem to believe that they're indestructible. I, mean, I was the same way. Um, I guess all teenagers are. They believe, I guess, nothing could ever happen to them. Satanic panic is something that I've droned on about quite a bit. It's such an interesting period of American history to me. With its recent resurgence in our age of social media and mass information, it only feels fitting to continue to study. Setting a rigid timeline for satanic panic by confining it to the American 1980s is a mistake. With how much slower information traveled and, in turn, how much slower the culture would evolve is something that needs to be considered. As cases like the McMartin preschool trial came to an end, the fog was beginning to lift, but as thick as that fog was and how sensational the media had been throughout the decade, it was far from the end of the satanic panic. Something that I've tried to convey, though a bit tepidly, was that the threat of underground satanic cults infiltrating communities across the United States and Canada was mostly for nothing. But if you give people an idea of what will scare and enrage you, your efforts to clamor about it will undoubtedly result in people engaging in exactly that space. Meaning that the fear of satanic and occult practices likely created real satanic and occult practicing. Music like heavy metal and gothic rock would lean heavily into these themes to rile up parents and dislodge the stick, if you know what I mean. The early 1990s saw cases like the West Memphis Three dominating headlines, proving very much that the satanic fears were not going anywhere. Their convictions in the circus surrounding the crime, boys, and the Bible Belt culture would make for a massive media spectacle. At this stage, while there was an outcry about how the trials and convictions were handled, given the lack of physical evidence in the presence of clear police misconduct, Damian Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. and Jason Baldwin were satanic child murderers, and there was little doubt about it among the Bible Belt households. 
Strongly religious households and what some would call flyover states were the blue-collar foundation of American culture. The 80s and 90s would see the beginning of the politically divisive tactics politicians have utilized and mutated into whatever is going on today. A growing internet, too, would likely contribute to the spread of ideas, and you had Generation X in their teens looking to make their mark on the culture and fire up their parents in much the same way that all generations do. And while the country did see a progressive mindset making their voices heard with the election of Bill Clinton, it was not a reflection of the overall cultural mindset. You can see Lucifer and occult themes evoked in today's social media discussion. My stance is that satanic panic never truly ended, and if I had to guess, it's sure to rise from the background of our modern day culture as the political circus kicks off for 2024, especially with language learning models and generative AI on the precipice of overtaking the online majority. But that, my friends, is an entirely different nightmare that I may cover in the future. From our seat in the future, the early 1990s was the starting line of the biggest shift in human culture that history has ever seen. And even here in the present, we can tell that it's all just beginning. Counterculture and Generation X's clash with the status quo was in full sway. Heavy metal was getting even more occult and intense than it had in the 1980s. And as with any point in American cultural history, there was plenty of fight left in the previous generation to push back. The devil was alive and well in the Bible Belt of the United States, and the stage was set for one of Tennessee's most shocking, brutal, and tragic history-making crimes. Krista Gail Pike was born in March of 1976 to her parents Clarissa and Emile in Beckley, West Virginia. Her parents remained married for only two years with a turbulent relationship that would ultimately lead to adultery and divorce. After being divorced for a year, they would remarry after Clarissa made an attempt on her own life, with the reunion lasting just two more years. As an infant and toddler, Krista was wildly neglected. She would be left to toddle in a waste-filled home while her mother engaged in a lifestyle of parties and debauchery. Her paternal grandmother would often attempt to help care for the young girl, creating a loving bond between the two that would be ripped away in 1988 with her grandmother's passing. In her youth, Krista would begin to experience seizures, a condition that would not be taken seriously by the adults in her life. These seizures were a result of organic brain damage and her mother's use of alcohol during her pregnancy. Throughout her childhood, she would face physical abuse from her father, maternal grandmother, and multiple of her mother's revolving door of partners, with one even being charged after striking her in the face. It was described by Dr. Jonathan Pincus, professor of neurology at Georgetown University, as an almost unbearably abusive background. According to a later petition that I will cover deeper in this video, she spent her childhood being shipped between her mother in North Carolina and her father in West Virginia. By the time she achieved her GED, she had changed schools 12 times, no doubt impacting her sense of security and ability to socialize. In the same time span, she was subjected to repeated and brutal sexual abuse by a large cast of perpetrators beginning at the age of two years old. It was clear that she was dealing with developmental and medical issues throughout her childhood, leading to her prepubescent years where she would begin to display mental health problems. With the loss of her grandmother in 1988, while she was only 12 years old, Krista Pike made an attempt on her own life and received almost no support in the wake of such urgent behavior. The cards that she was dealt were clearly setting her up for a life of trauma and failure. She had developed bipolar disorder and PTSD over the course of her intense childhood, and by the time she reached adulthood at 18, she had a story of traumatic experiences that you likely wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. But it's where her life would go from here that puts into question the validity of everything I've just told you for me personally at least. But we'll get there. Knoxville, Tennessee was founded in 1786 and served as the state's first capital, making it integral to the shape and evolution of the state's place in the country. It was a hub for the growing railway system connecting the country and allowing trade throughout the 19th century. Like many states, it relied on manufacturing as the Industrial Revolution kicked off, but by the 1980s, began to shift toward a more modern economic state and would even host the 1982 World's Fair. Before Tennessee was even a state, the University of Tennessee-Knoxville was established in 1794. Like most colleges in the country, 
and has a storied history involving everything from civil rights to college football. In 1995, it was home to 25,000 plus students looking to begin their adult lives and better themselves in preparation to make their mark on the world. And it was here, just outside the grounds at UT Knoxville, Tennessee, where our stage is set for a satanic brutality that the state had likely never seen before. In the autumn of 1994, Pike would attend the Job Corps Center near the college in Knoxville, Tennessee, a government jobs program that offers vocational training after dropping out of high school. She was hoping to gain job skills and establish her journey to becoming a nurse. It would be here that she would meet and become involved with Tadaryl Ship. Born in 1978, Tadaryl Ship was just 17 years old at the time, and as a juvenile, information about him and his life outside of his time with Krista Pike in the Job Corps Center is fairly light. What is known is that he carried an interest in the occult and satanic subjects. It would be an interest that he shared with Krista, and the two would delve into black magic and other celestial musings. Given Pike's history of mental health issues and turbulent childhood, her relationship with Ship and their shared interest would be something extremely important to her. So when a fellow Job Corps attendee, Colleen Slemmer, entered the picture, seemingly fawning over to Daryl Ship as well, it was something that Krista Pike was not going to take lightly. The brutal murder of 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer created fear and speculation among students and staff Friday. Knoxville police quickly dispelled any myths about the case with a break in their investigation. It did not involve a university student. It did not occur on the bike trail. Uh, it was not a random or a stranger to stranger uh, incident. While the murder was not directly linked to the university other than location, authorities say students and faculty should always exercise caution, especially at night in areas like this. Colleen Slemmer was born in June of 1979. She was described in the news reports as a typical teenager looking to better her place in the world by enrolling in the Job Corps in much the same way as the other attendees were. With her family being quite private, not much is known about Slemmer's early life. But what is known is that joining the Job Corps Center in Knoxville would ultimately lead her to Tadaryl Ship and Krista Pike. In January of 1995, as the year was just beginning to take off, Pike's focus would turn to the young Colleen Slemmer. Given her troubled life thus far and mental health issues, she would begin to hyper-focus on Slemmer, believing her to be attracted to and attempting to steal away to Daryl Ship as a love interest. From what I could find, it was a feeling with seemingly no merit other than her proximity to the pair. A raging jealousy and psychological damage would result in a rising desire to take some kind of action against her. As the second week of the year ticked on, Pike and Ship would begin to premeditate the slaying of Colleen Slemmer. Court documents would indicate that Tadaryl Ship believed he needed a human sacrifice to satiate some celestial demand, and Pike wanted to rid herself of her perceived love rival. Pike, in the days leading up to the 12th of January, would make little effort to hide her intentions, even telling fellow classmates what those plans were, simply because she was feeling mean that day. Recruiting a third party, Shadala Peterson, the trio would begin their plans to lure Slemmer to a secluded part of the Job Corps agricultural grounds and end her with a box cutter and a small meat cleaver that they had procured. On the evening of January 12, 1995, the three would do exactly that. They would approach Slemmer and convince her to go with them to the woods to smoke, which was alluring enough to the young girl to trust them. They would embark deep into a wooded area of the grounds, and as they walked further away from civilization, conversation and attitudes would suddenly take a dark turn. Once the four of them were isolated, Krista Pike would confront Slemmer on her perceived intentions with Tadaryl Ship, convinced that Colleen was trying to steal her boyfriend away. Slemmer would deny the accusations, but Pike in her fragile mental state refused to believe her, and as the pleas and confrontations went on, Krista Pike would begin to get angrier and angrier. Eventually, Slemmer was cornered and involved in a verbal match with Pike and the others, and as the words reached a crescendo, Pike would launch a brutal attack with her blade. The attack would be prolonged and brutal, with Peterson joining in with a box cutter. As Slemmer pleaded for mercy, she would vow to walk away from the Knoxville grounds all the way to her home in Florida if they allowed her to go. When she attempted to run, she was tripped by Tadaryl Ship, striking her head on a rock and leading to Pike increasing her brutality. Eventually, they would gag Colleen with a dirty rag, carve a pentagram into her chest as a form of ritualistic malice, 
and begin to strike and beat her. Pike would ultimately end the ritualistic slaying by slashing her throat and viciously striking her in the head with a nearby rock. The attack would last half an hour, ending with an exhausted and excited Krista Pike taking a piece of Slemmer's shattered skull as a souvenir. The trio departed the woods, leaving her body where it was and made their way back to campus. Colleen Slemmer suffered immensely, begging for mercy and having her cries fall upon evil and deaf ears. She fought, pleaded and cried and deserved not the fate that befell her. No amount of psychological trauma, troubled childhoods or occult callings could justify the pain and fear that is now burned like a nuclear shadow in the secluded surroundings of their ritual site. It was harrowing and tragic, and that is what I want you to take away from this as we continue. A tip led authorities to Knoxville's Job Corps, where 18-year-old Krista Pike and 17-year-old Tadaryl Ship were arrested around 2 o'clock Saturday morning. Police say the murder suspects were close to the victim. The motive of the crime appears to be a love triangle. Krista Pike, to Daryl Ship, and Shadala Peterson returned to their dorms and lives as normal, taking very little care to hide what they had done. In fact, Pike would show off her prize and brag about her actions to the same classmates she had told her plan to just days prior. She began pointing out the bloodstains on her shoes and showing off the piece of skull she had taken with her to multiple students on the morning of the 13th. She described the injuries that she inflicted on Slemmer, boasting about the rock she had used to finally end her suffering and collect her trophy. None of the classmates that were told about the event would go to the police. Instead, a groundskeeper would discover Slemmer's body in its resting place the very next day, seeing the brutality and satanic elements of what was left behind. As such, police would be notified from that point and an investigation into the ritual killing of Colleen Slemmer would begin. Responding officers would later testify that she was nearly unrecognizable. They would secure the scene and summon homicide investigators to track down exactly what had taken place. As other officers arrived, they began securing the crime area. As officers discovered other areas of blood, articles of clothing, footprints, and broken foliage, the crime scene tripled in size, eventually encompassing an area 100 feet long by 60 feet wide. The crime scene was wet and muddy, and there was evidence of a scuffle with trampled bushes, hand and knee prints in the mud, and drag marks. A large pool of blood was found about 30 feet from the victim's body. Naturally, it would take no time at all before she was connected to Pike and Ship, and they were brought in for questioning. Investigators would advise them of their rights, with Pike waving them to give a statement. Pike didn't hold back and described everything she and her group had done to Slemmer. She confessed to it all and investigators would collect clothing in the piece of skull that she took as a trophy, charging her with first degree premeditated murder. With Pike being 18 years old, there was no question about how she would be tried. With all of the evidence left at the scene, Pike's complete lack of remorse or willingness to hide her crimes and the ease of investigation it was looking like an open and shut case for law enforcement and the justice system. The local media in Knoxville would cover the crime extensively. Given its shocking nature in both execution and occult themes, it was a sensational story that required very little work to pique interest in a very religious area of the country. Obviously, this local coverage wouldn't be contained to Knoxville and spread throughout the rest of the country as another ritual murder taking place in the heart of the United States. This was an age of growing access to information and the beginnings of the 24-hour news cycle that's in its final mutated stage today. The competition between national news outlets led to sensational media coverage, regardless of substance, but the Krista Pike case hit all of the notes. With its widespread and shocking coverage, as well as how readily those involved confessed to their disturbing actions, it's probably the most solid case for a satanic ritual outbreak that I've ever covered on the channel. I imagine that how open and shut it all was made it hard on the Slemmer family, which explains to me at least why they chose to be as closed off as they did. With all eyes on Knoxville, Tennessee and Krista Pike, the trial and emerging details were sure to light a media fire of its own. I think I deserve to be in here for the rest of my life. I do, I know I do. I know I don't deserve to be out walking around with everybody else in normal society. I did something horrible that is unacceptable, and I realize that. But I don't deserve to die for the actions of three individuals when I'm only one person. 
In March of 1996, when she was 20 years old, Krista Pike was convicted of first-degree murder. With the confession and all of the evidence gathered and presented, deliberations took just a few hours. The real aim of Pike's defense was the sentencing phase of the trial. They presented the tragic backstory and troubled youth, as well as all of her mental and medical issues in a desperate attempt to keep her from being sentenced to death. But the brutality and occult nature of the crime were more than enough to convince the jury that this particular monster deserved a grave. All of this would result in Cresta Pike becoming the youngest woman as well as the only woman in Tennessee to be put on death row. On the 12th day of January, 1997, your body shall be subjected to shock by sufficient current of electricity. <coughs> God have mercy upon you. With Ship being tried as an adult, he was given life imprisonment. Shadala Peterson was not tried as an adult, however, and despite participating in the act and the aftermath, she was given a probationary sentence. A media frenzy would ensue surrounding the case both at the time of the crime and as the trial progressed. It had all of the makings of a satanic panic headline, except this time there was real evidence behind the claims. It feeds an already full-speed media machine hot off the heels of the West Memphis Three. Access to newspapers costs money and I don't have money. So. Getting a feel for myself of the atmosphere was tough, but if you were there, I'd really love to hear your experience in the comments. Pike's conviction would be the beginning of her legal fight for her life in a fitting twist of irony. Over the coming decades, she would file multiple appeals, all being denied one by one, as she and her lawyers looked to have her sentence commuted to life imprisonment. Her appeals history reflects her disjointed thinking, with her launching appeals, requesting them to be canceled and have her execution expedited, and changing her mind once more and deciding to continue the appeal. Her appeals efforts made their way out of Tennessee and into the federal system. But again, all appeals would be rejected and the lower court's decision would be upheld. Her past and mental issues were presented, along with ineffective counsel grounds. Likely, her antics within the prison system itself didn't exactly help her case. The move comes as executions remain on hold in Tennessee. That's because an independent investigation found the state hadn't been following its own rule book on executions opening the door for possible contamination of the chemicals used in lethal injections. In August of 2001, Pike and an alleged accomplice attacked and tried to end a fellow inmate with a shoestring. While there was insufficient evidence to charge the other party, Pike was charged with attempted murder with her nearly succeeding in her attempts on the inmate's life. It would take almost exactly three years for her to be convicted, adding another violent crime to her already astonishing rap sheet. And as if a first-degree satanic murder and an attempted shoestring assassination weren't enough, in 2011, Pike began a pen pal correspondence with a man from New Jersey. It's unclear how the arrangement began, but Donald Kohut, a man in his mid-30s, appears to have fallen head over heels for our psychopathic vixen. Over the course of their relationship, Kohut would make frequent trips from New Jersey to Tennessee, where Pike was incarcerated, a trip that ran about 1,800 miles. During their communications, Kohut devised a plan to break Pike out of prison and bribed a guard to get a tracing of a prison key with plans to make a duplicate. In 2012, before the plan could be put into action, it was uncovered by security and Kohut, as well as the corrupted guard, would be arrested and charged, landing Kohut in prison himself for seven years. Pike, however, could not be proven to have contributed to the plan outside of simply being aware of it. But being on death row, I'm not sure any punishment would have mattered anyway. Tadero Ship, at 17, could not be sentenced to death and currently has a shot at parole coming up in 2026. Shadala Peterson, the youngest participant, cooperated with the investigation and, like I said, served a six-year probationary sentence. Collectives in favor of Krista's commutation point to the leniency given to her similar-in-age co-conspirators as justification for their cause. Several execution dates for Pike have been set and stayed as appeals for commutation got in the way. Slemmer's family is currently ready for it to be done and over with. As of the time of this video, Pike is still on death row awaiting her execution, and should she be put down, she would be the first woman executed in Tennessee in two centuries. What I want to see from the judge right now would be to get a date and put her down instead of waiting another year or another day. 
Colleen Slimmer's mother says she would like to see a date scheduled for Krista Pike to be executed. As I've told this story, the media and events have clearly been a focal point. As the starting line of a wild 24-hour news cycle, this case fed a beast everything it needed for a captivating story. The occult themes, young ages of the perpetrators, and brutality fed right into the continuing satanic panic, but this time, all of their claims would have basis in reality. Telling Krista Pike's story in the way that I have may appear to be sympathetic to her. A lot of her early life information comes from sources banding together to get her taken off of death row, so it all reads like an excuse. An excuse that didn't convince a judge and certainly didn't convince me. Colleen Slemmer suffered in a way that most of us will never experience. For no other reason than Pike's twisted mind and fabricated threat to her relationship. I would not wish Krista Pike's childhood on anyone, but for her to be fighting for her life for such an extended amount of time while she wastes away in a cell in Tennessee is so poetically ironic. Colleen Slemmer should be at the forefront of your mind when considering your opinion on Krista Pike's fate, however you feel about the death penalty. In a world that is wired the way it is, she certainly fits the criteria for the rabid criminals such a practice aims to rid our societies of. I hope that the Slemmer family and all of the people who had to witness the carnage and carry that for their remaining days have found peace. Mental illness, sensational media, and another appearance of occult ritual actions have made the case of Krista Pike and her cohorts one of the most notable in American history. It fueled a media beast that has mutated into something horrible in the modern day, and there's not much you can say against it this time. While it's certainly something that the system should consider, the undeveloped brain and the alleged traumas residing in it that Krista Pike is cursed with was not enough to convince a judge or jury that she deserves any leniency at all. To borrow a gimmick from a very punk rock friend of mine, you aren't going to find many people involved in these satanic panic stories being as much of a monster as Krista Pike. If you've made it this far or by some miracle saw this video at all, thank you for letting me tell you another story. My compass for topics is effectively things that interest me, but it often doesn't appear to interest very many others in quite the same way. And if you liked it, like it. If you disliked it, dislike it and tell me why. And make sure you're subscribed for more videos like this. If you'd like to support further, you can become a member or check out the Patreon for an array of perks and other fun happenings. There's a decent backlog of videos on the channel now to check out, so if you liked this one, I'm sure you'll dig a bunch of the others. We've caught a pretty good pace for releases, and depending on how this one is received, we should be back to doing more true crime among other fascinating things like exorcisms. Remember to love your pets, and I'll catch you in the next video. Big Patreon and member shout out to Daniel, Gage, Jeremy, Leslie, Lisa, McLean, Richard, Ryan, Weapon Sun Gaming, Craig, Dr. Spiderface, Christian, big shout out for Melissa, who is both a member and a patron, Ghost Dragon, who did all the music for this video, and, uh, and of course my mommy.